Please be seated. Please be seated. Raja Abdul Noor Sahib, Salawat. Assalamualaikum. Alaikum. <coughs> Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Wa'budullah wa la tushariku bihi shay'a وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا وَبِذِي الْقُرْبَى وَالْيَتَامَى وَالْمَسَاكِينِ وَالْجَارِزِ الْقُرْبَى وَالْجَارِ الْجُنُوبِ وَالصَّاحِبِ بِالْجَنْبِ وَابْنِ السَّبِيلِ وَالصَّاحِبِ بِالْجَنْبِ وَابْنِ السَّبِيلِ وَمَا مَلَكَتْ أَيْمَانُكُمْ إن الله لا يحب من كان مختالا فخورا إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وَيْتَاءِ ذِي الْقُرْبَى وَيَنْهَى عَنِ الْفَحْشَاءِ وَالْمُنْكَرِ وَالْبَغْيِ يَعِزُكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَذَكَّرُونَ يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسُ إِنَّا خَلَقْنَاكُمْ مِنْ زَكَرٍ وَأُنْثَى وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ شُعُوبًا وَقَبَائِلَ لِتَعَارَفُوا إِنَّ أَكْرَمَكُمْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَتْكَاكُمْ إن الله عليم خبير. Nun folgt die deutsche Übersetzung der soeben vorgetragenen Verse aus dem Heiligen Koran. Dies ist eine Zusammensetzung aus Auszügen drei verschiedener Suren: der Sura Al-Nisa, Vers 37, Sura An-Nahl, Vers 91 und der Surah Al-Hujrat, Vers 14. Ich suche Zuflucht bei Allah vor Satan, dem Verfluchten, im Namen Allahs, des Gnädigen, des Barmherzigen. Verehret Allah und setzet ihm nichts zur Seite und erweiset Güte den Eltern, den Verwandten, 
den Weisen und den Bedürftigen, dem Nachbarn, der ein Anverwandter und dem Nachbarn, der ein Fremder ist, dem Gefährten an eurer Seite und dem Wanderer und denen, die eure rechte Hand besitzt. Wahrlich, Allah liebt nicht die Stolzen, die Prahler. Allah gebietet, Gerechtigkeit und uneigennützig Gutes zu tun und zu spenden wie den Verwandten. Und er verbietet das Schändliche und das offenbar Schlechte und die Übertretung. Er ermahnt euch, auf dass ihr es beherzigt. O ihr Menschen, wir haben euch von Mann und Frau erschaffen und euch zu Völkern und Stämmen gemacht, dass ihr einander kennen möget. Wahrlich, der Angesehenste von euch ist vor Allah der, der unter euch der Gottesfürchtigste ist. Siehe, Allah ist allwissend, allkundig. Ich werde <clears throat> All distinguished guests, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuhu. Peace and blessing of Allah be upon you all. First of all, I would like to take this opportunity to offer my sincere gratitude to all of our guests who have graciously accepted our invitation to attend the Jalsa Salana, despite not being members of our community. Your interest in learning about Islam and willingness to attend this religious event testifies to your open hearts and tolerance. Today, I wish to briefly address and respond to certain major allegations commonly leveled against Islam. For example, it is alleged that Islam's teachings are extremist and encourage Muslims to use force and violence to conquer lands or to eliminate other religions and beliefs. It is also claimed that Muslims consider non-Muslims inferior and that Islam does not prioritize human values or bestow equal rights to certain sections of society. <clears throat> especially women. As I said, one of the principal allegations leveled at Islam is that it was spread by a sword and that Muslims are permitted to engage in violence to compel others to accept its teachings. In this respect, it is vital, it is vital to a certain that the Holy Quran, which is the basis of the Islam, all Islamic teachings, says in relation to the propagation of Islam. In chapter 10, verse 100 of the Holy Quran, Allah the Almighty states, and if thy Lord had enforced his will, surely all who are on the earth would have believed together. Will thou then force men, men to become believers? Here, Allah the Almighty proclaims that if he, is, he, if he so desired, he could have compelled all people to accept Islam. However, he determined that human beings would have free will. Thereafter, Allah the Almighty states that if he did not 
compel mankind to accept Islam. It was impossible for the Holy Prophet وسلم, or his true followers to violate the principle of freedom of belief. This verse alone is unequivocal proof that Islam does not permit the use of force in religious matters and that every person is free to choose their own path. In a similar way, chapter 18, verse 30 of the Holy Quran states, and say it is the, uh, uh, it is the truth from your Lord. Wherefore, let him who will believe and let him who will disbelieve. Whilst affirming that Islam is a true religion from God and is the pinnacle of truth, leading mankind towards salvation. This verse in reiterates that every person is free to accept or reject its teachings. Islam does not permit Muslims to propagate their faith coercively through the abhorrent and destructive power of swords, bombs, or guns, but instead calls on them to use reason, evidence, and love to win the hearts and minds of mankind. Above all, Islam teaches that it is paramount that all people live amicably together and that society is underpinned by a spirit of mutual respect and tolerance, irrespective of differing beliefs. Moreover, Allah the Almighty has repeatedly commanded Muslims to attain the, height, high, the highest morals, moral standards in even small or seemingly insignificant day-to-day -day matters. It teaches Muslims to ensure their conduct is of the highest order. Further, Islam does not tell Muslims to limit kindness to their loved ones or fellow Muslims. On the contrary, the Holy Quran instructs Muslims to treat all people with justice, benevolence, and compassion. For instance, chapter 5, verse 9 of the Holy Quran enshrines a timeless and magnificent standard of truth and integrity. Allah the Almighty states, let not a people enmity incite you to act otherwise than with justice. The verse goes on to state that be always just that is nearer to righteousness. This verse defines the standard of justice and advocated by uh, of justice, justice advocated by Islam, which requires that even if some, uh, someone has grievously mistreated or persecuted you, it must never lead you to seek revenge or be anything other than pro proportionate and fair in your response. Throughout history, wars and disputes have plagued society and this sorrowful trend continues today. Can it be said that such honorable standards of justice are being upheld in international relations or amongst warring nations, irrespective of whether their governments are secular or religious? The simple answer is no. Only in Islam do we find such an unequivocal and fearless principle of absolute justice, and it is a cause of great regret that even modern day Muslim governments are failing to govern according to this Islamic standard. Another oft repeated allegation is that Islam is a religion of warfare and bloodshed. In this respect, it should be clear that Allah the Almighty has never given Muslims free reign to fight or take up arms. Where the Holy Quran granted permission to fight, it was only under extreme circumstances and with stringent conditions and restrictions 
imposed. Unquestionably, if one looks at the early period of Islam through an objective and impartial lens, they will see that the battles fought by the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing of Allah be upon him, were entirely defensive in nature. After patiently enduring years of unspeakable cruelties and sustained persecution at the hands of the non-Muslims, non-Muslim disbelievers in his hometown of Mecca, the Holy Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and his companions migrated to the Arabian city of Medina. However, even after migrating, they could not live in peace as the Mecca, Meccan army aggressively pursued them, intending to kill the Holy Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and eliminate Islam once and for all. Under those uh, extreme circumstances, Allah the Almighty permitted the Muslims to engage in a defensive battle. The permission is enshrined in chapter 22, verse 40-41 of the Holy Quran, which states, permission to fight is given to those against whom war is made, because they have been wronged, and Allah indeed has power to help them. Those who have been driven out from their homes unjustly, only because they said, our Lord is Allah, and if Allah did not repel, repel some men by means of others, there would be surely have been, uh, there, sh uh, there would surely have been pulled down cloisters and churches and synagogues and mosques wherein the name of Allah is oft commemorated. These verses demonstrate that Allah the Almighty did not command the Holy Prophet Muhammad وسلم, to fight back only to save the Islamic faith. Rather, the Holy Quran testifies that the ultimate objective of the Meccans was to eradicate all religions and to demolish all place of worship. It was only then that Allah the Almighty commanded the Muslims to fight back in order to establish the universal principle of freedom of conscience and belief. Indeed, according to Islam's teachings, if ever the followers of other religions seek the help of Muslims to protect and preserve religious freedom, Muslims should support them. If these are Islam's actual teachings, you may query why terrorists have conducted heinous attacks in the name of Islam in recent years. The answer is that hateful extremists or those with political objectives have extra extrapolated entirely false conclusions from certain verses of the Holy Quran to serve their own evil desires and interests. Yet, if a person studies the proper context of those verses impartially, they will see that Islam does not permit any forms of cruelty, and there are no contradictions within the Holy Quran or Islamic teachings. Without doubt, each Quranic verse lies in perfect harmony with one another. Another golden principle for ensuring peace in society is given in chapter 16, verse 91 of the Holy Quran, where Allah the Almighty states, Verily, Allah enjoins justice and the doing of good to others, and giving like kindred, and forbids indecency, and manifest, and, and manifest evil and transgression. He admonishes you that you may take heed. In this verse, Allah the Almighty commands Muslims to not only act with justice, but to, be, to go beyond this and to treat all people, regardless of their religious affiliation, with love and compassion. 
in obligation, uh, it, uh, it obliges Muslims to help others selflessly without desiring anything in return. Furthermore, this verse expressly prohibits Muslims from acts of rebellion or violating the laws of the land. Given this, there is no question of a true Muslim being a threat to his nation or people. In the very next verse, Allah the Almighty states, and fulfill the covenant of Allah when you have made and break not the oaths after making them firm, while you have made Allah your surety, certainly Allah knows what you do. Here, Allah the Almighty states that Muslims must never break their word or fail to uphold their pledges. Those guilty of violating their oaths will be held directly accountable by Allah the Almighty. Often, the loyalty and trustworthiness of Muslim immigrants to the West is questioned. Yet, as citizens, whether there is here in Germany or elsewhere, Muslims pledge loyalty and sincerity to their nations and vow, vow to, um, to be law-abiding. It is their religious duty to uphold this pledge, faithfully serve their nation and strive towards its prosperity. Indeed, a well-known hadith saying of the Holy Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is that love for one's nation is a part of one's faith. Given this, how can it be suggested that true Muslims are not loyal to loyal citizens or likely to sow seeds of division in society? Rather, fulfilling their pledge requires Muslims to be ever ready to make all possible sacrifices for the sake of their nation. What can be a better form of integration than for Muslim immigrants to live with the heartfelt conviction that though they were born elsewhere, they are now part of their adopted nation and stand ready to make great sacrifices for the sake of its prosperity. Furthermore, they pledge to reject any form of rebellion against the state and to refrain from all unlawful activities. Hence, it is entirely wrong to assert that Islamic teachings are such that Muslims are incapable of assimilating into non-Muslim nations. If, due to their religious convictions, a Muslim abstains from drinking alcohol, chooses not to go to nightclubs, dresses modestly or rejects behavior that is contrary to their moral values, it does not mean that they have failed to integrate. Rather, I believe integration requires an immigrant to always seek the betterment of his adopted nation, to be ready for all sacrifices for it, and to endeavor to serve his people with sincerity. Such integration is a means of ensuring that diversity in society will not result in division or conflict. Instead, it will prove a means of enriching that society and strong bonds of unity will be forged amongst its citizens. In terms of serving their society, Muslims have a particular duty to help and protect those who are vulnerable or suffering in any way. For example, in chapter 51, verse 20, the Holy Quran, um, of the Holy Quran, Allah the Almighty states, and in their wealth was a share for one who asked for help and for those who could not. In this verse, the Holy Quran states that the hallmark of a true Muslim is that they should care for all of God's creation and support those in need, whether they seek their help or not. Muslims should not wait for someone to ask for help, but should pro proactively 
and identify those in society who are in distress and help them overcome their challenges or troubles. Here, where the, the Holy Quran says that some living beings cannot speak or assert their needs, it includes animals. Some people think Islam discourages keeping pets or showing love to animals, but this verse requires the Muslim to diligently care for animals under their supervision or care. Likewise, this verse also hints at the importance of wildlife conservation and protecting the world around us. Similarly, in chapter 90, verse 14, verse 17, 14 to 17 of the Holy Quran, Allah the Almighty instructs Muslims to support the most vulnerable members of society. It calls on Muslims to feed the hungry and aid those mired in poverty. Muslims are taught to help those people who are isolated and do not have a network of family or friends to support them. Moreover, these verses direct Muslims to seek justice and emancipation, emancipation for those inhumanly bound by shackles of slavery or oppression. Muslims are told to treat orphans with love and to ensure their rights are protected and to comfort them, those deprived in any way. These enlightened verses of the Holy Quran are a call to humanity to stand up for the rights of the weakest members of society and to help them stand on their own feet. Indeed, they instruct Muslims to play a foremost role in eliminating all forms of slavery, poverty, and deprivation from the world. It in, in essence, the Holy Quran teaches us that serving humanity is a fundamental means of spiritual progress. There are many more verses of the Holy Quran that highlight the importance of fulfilling other people's rights. In chapter 2, verse 149 of the Holy Quran, Allah the Almighty alludes to the fact that every person is different and has their own perspective in life and personal ambitions. Yet Allah states that a Muslim's overriding goal and objective should be to excel in righteousness and fundamental to righteousness is exhibiting love and compassion towards others. Thereafter, chapter 4, verse 37 of the Holy Quran reiterates the importance of showing love to others. For example, it stipulates that people should treat their parents with tenderness and patience. It also identifies the rights of one's relatives, loved ones, and those who are impoverished or orphaned. The verse also recognizes recognizes the rights of one's neighbors and the def definition of a neighbor according to Islam is far-reaching. At a minimum, one's neighbors constitute the 40 homes, 40 homes surrounding their own. It includes one's travel companions, work colleagues, and subordinates. If every person fulfilled the rights of the surrounding 40 homes and their colleagues and companions, there is no doubt that society would be harmonious and free from conflict. Another golden principle to ensure the peace of society is given to ch in chapter 49, verse 12 of the Holy Quran, where Allah the Almighty states that it is entirely wrong to deride or humiliate other nations or peoples. To mock or demean others in sh is sure to cause resentment and shatter the peace of society. Recently, in Sweden, certain individuals have burned and vandalized copies of the Holy Quran and proudly displayed this despicable act on social media. Similarly, for many years, highly offensive caricatures have been published depicting the Holy Prophet Muhammad 
our objection to such vile acts is not limited to those incidents in which only Islam or Muslims are targeted. Rather, we firmly believe that denigrating what is sacred to the followers of any religion is reprehensible and to be condemned in the strongest terms. Such acts needlessly provoke and hurt innocent people and incite strong feelings of anger and resentment. They are a means of undermining the peace and cohesion of society. Islam teaches that it is essential to care for the sentiments and feelings of one, other, uh, one another with sensitivity and consideration. Moving on, and before concluding, I also wish to address the question of women's rights in Islam. Certainly, when it comes to women's rights, Islam has been frequently misrepresented. Rather, then deny women their rights. The truth is that Islam actually established women's rights and did so centuries before similar rights were afforded by those nations that are now considered to be progressive. In an age of, in an age when women's rights were not even deemed worthy of consideration, the Holy Quran and the Holy Prophet of Islam وسلم, enshrined forever countless rights of women and girls, including the rights to education, to divorce, and to inherit. On one occasion, the Holy Prophet of Islam وسلم, gave an, an analogy of a woman being like a rib. As such, they were delicate and to be treated with love and tenderness. If one analyzes this statement carefully, they will realize how esteemed the status of women in Islam is. The human rib is designed to protect a person's vital organs. And so by describing women in such a way, the Holy Prophet وسلم, has pointed to the fact that women are fundamental to the survival of humanity. Another famous saying of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing of Allah be upon him, is that paradise lies under the feet of one's mother. Women have been given this unique and elevated status because mothers play the foremost role in nurturing society's next generation and make immense sacrifices for the sake of their children. If a woman fulfills her duties to her children, it will enable them to develop into moral and righteous individuals who contribute positively to society. In this way, mothers are the means of success and prosperity for their children in this life and guide them on the path leading to paradise in the hereafter. In terms of the Holy Quran, chapter 4, verse 20 provides an outstanding means of establishing, establishing women's domestic rights. The verse specifically instructs Muslims, men to treat their wives lovingly and be considerate of their needs. It stipulates that women are free individuals and cannot be forced into the possession of any man. In terms of their finances, whatever a woman earns is hers to keep and her husband cannot demand a share. Upon divorce, Islam teaches that women, women are free to keep whatever their husbands gave them during their marriage. In today's world, when a marriage breaks down, protracted conflicts and bitter disputes often occur. 
as men seek to recover what they have given to their wives. However, Islam does not permit this. Reiterating how women should be treated, chapter 16, verse 73 of the Holy Quran states that men should treat their wives with tenderness and cherish those who have given birth to their children. Moreover, in chapter 2, verse 188, verse 188, Allah the Almighty states that a wife is a garment for her, for her husband and a husband is a garment for his wife, meaning that a husband and wife are of equal standing and a means of protection for one another. They should manifest love and protect one and uh, they would manifest love and protect one another, rather than being a source of hurt or sorrow for their partner. In the short time available, I have only mentioned a few of the rights of women established by Islam. Suffice to say that allegation that Islam denies women's rights is baseless and contrary to the facts. Indeed, it is no exaggeration to suggest that the Islamic concept of women's rights was genuinely revolutionary. And as I outlined earlier, many other allegations have been leveled at Islam and all are without foundation. <clears throat> Certainly, it is, wholly, it is wholly wrong for Islam to be brandished as a religion of violence or extremism or to claim that Islam's moral values are lacking in any way. It is entirely unjust to say that Islam seeks to instigate disorder in society. On the contrary, it is a religion that seeks to build bridges amongst people of all faiths and beliefs. It is a religion that promotes peace, love, and harmony. Indeed, the world, the, the word Islam literally means peace and security. If some Muslims fail to fulfill the rights of others, it is their personal failure and not the fault of Islam or its teachings. Such people are guilty of violating their faith's teachings. With these words, I hope that any question you may have had about Islam will have been suitably addressed. But if any of you require further explanation, you can speak to our missionaries or our mission here and scholars later. At the end, I pray that the people of the world may come to recognize their creator and may all mankind, irrespective of their religious beliefs, live together in peace and with the spirit of compassion and respect for one another. I mean, finally, I take this opportunity to thank you all again for joining us today. Thank you very much. Meine lieben Gäste, seine Heiligkeit wird nun ein stilles Gebet leiten. Auch Sie sind herzlich dazu eingeladen, auf Ihre Weise daran teilzunehmen. Vielen Dank. Be silent prayer. I mean,